Roy Weaver. Roy, born in 1922, he grew up in South St. Louis playing uh, baseball as a youth, and I would imagine in those early days, hockey was uh, a little known sport. Uh, during the 50s, he played for the Octopus Hockey Club of St. Louis, and I've seen the picture of the banner. I'd love to have that banner with that octopus. In the early 60s, he was involved in efforts with Eddie Olson to start home and home games with teams in Peoria and Pekin, Illinois. Uh, they involved into a tri-state league with teams from Pekin, Peoria, Chicago, and Keokuk, Iowa. The St. Louis players represented Springfield, Illinois as the Falcons. In fact, I had an uncle on that team, I believe. With the basis of players from Springfield and young players coming out of the youth programs, the Senior Men's League was formed at Winterland and soon blossomed into several teams at different levels. He started a Learn to Play program in Granite City in 1967. That was the first year of that rink's existence. In 1973, he became a member of the NHL off-ice officials here in St. Louis. Many people will remember him as the man that gave out numbered scraps of papers prior to uh, to kids prior to Blues games. The kids would come to the penalty box after the game and exchange these numbers for broken hockey sticks. That's one way to get rid of them. Because of his exceptional attendance at Blues games, Roy would kid our honoree tonight, Gary Unger, that he was competing with him for the Ironman title. His other interests, how about these? Flying airplanes, riding motorcycles, and riding horses. He was an accomplished artist, and of course, he uh, drew hockey players as often as he could. Ladies and gentlemen, accepting for Roy Weaver tonight is his son, Larry. Good evening. I want to thank, uh, on behalf of my brother Lon, Tim, and our families, I want to thank the organization for this honor. This is a great function, and I'm glad to see so many people recognized for their, their input to hockey in the St. Louis area. I have uh, long memories of my father associated with hockey. Uh, I don't have this memory, actually, but my mother and father met at a, at a, at a Flyers game. So that was, uh, that, that was the beginning of it. Uh, I, my memories of, of Roy and hockey were uh, sitting on a park bench at the Post-Dispatch Lake in Forest Park and watching his buddies play hockey on the pond and having a great time. Uh, I was freezing, but they were having a great, great time. <laughs> and uh, I remember they had uh, having a wonderful time with the fellows he played on the Octopus Club with in the uh, mid to late late 50s. And it's funny that uh, senior men's hockey kind of took, uh, took a start out of state, out of, uh, out of town with uh, organizing the Tri-State League that Keokuk, uh, Chicago Suburban teams, and uh, Peak and Peoria played in, uh, based in Springfield. And uh, the St. Louis team played. Uh, on, as, as the Springfield Falcons. When uh, Winterland opened here, and that's a great milestone in uh, St. Louis hockey history, uh, the senior men's team moved down here. And it wasn't long after that that uh, the Blues acquired, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the Solomon brothers. Uh, they had the, had the franchise for in NHL expansion for St. Louis. And that coincided with uh, Granite City's Park District ice rink uh, being built. The, their first seasons uh, were in 67. And uh, they wouldn't let you play hockey in that rink at that time. And they, uh, they planned on making all of their revenues from uh, public, public skates. Well, the next year, they let them play hockey there. <laughs> they couldn't cover the cost with uh, revenues from uh, public sessions. But Roy was uh, Roy and Bill Hodge, who was rink manager, started the uh, Grand City Amateur Youth Hockey Organization, and from that organization, uh, many people 
came to coach in the area, uh, play. They contribute now as parents to players. And uh, a couple of those people were uh, Steve Dianetta, who's associated with this organization, was on the first Pee Wee team. Uh, Jay Kennesser became involved in Granite City Hockey, and we all know Jake's contributions to hockey in the St. Louis area. My best times uh, in hockey, and I'm sure my brother Lon will agree, were being able to play senior men's hockey with our father. I started playing in the uh, in the Tri-State League in Springfield, and later Lon began playing in the Senior Men's League in St. Louis here. And not too many guys get to play hockey with their father, uh, exception of maybe one person here in the audience. I see Terry McKenna over there, and uh, he started in the Tri-State League up there playing with his father, Bill, whose uh, hockey playing days paralleled my father's throughout and then their NHL officiating career also. I enjoy it. My brother and myself are both uh, off-ice officials currently, and I enjoy it when grown men come up to me and tell me what an influence my father was on their lives during their uh, playing days. So I think that's what every coach wants to hear. Again, thank you. Before we go to our two professionals, I want to tell you one other incident, kind of a funny incident happened to me while televising blues hockey. And this is a good one. I was a very um, gun-ho, impetuous uh, young broadcaster in 19, late 1970s. And uh, the team was playing great. We went to Chicago and we're playing the Blackhawks. And of course, it's always difficult to even get in and out of the building at Chicago Stadium with fans wanting to uh, uh, remove one of your limbs or do something else to you as you entered the building. But we had to sit out, we, again, and we had to sit out in the stands virtually, uh, a little overhang box with the old arenas had, so we had to walk through the crowd and step over them with literally uh, Blackhawk fans sitting at my back. Uh, I was doing the games with Ron Jacober on Channel 5, and uh, the Blues had a great night. We got off to a great start. And uh, by the second period, we're up eight to two. I mean, we're creaming them. And the fans are, the fans have nothing to do. They're, they, they're tired of booing by then. And I saw as I'm doing the game up and down that the fans had beach balls, a couple of beach balls. And they're batting them around the crowd. And uh, that was fine. End of the period came, though, and, and we always did a between periods interview. And we had someone in there, and I was going to do the stand up. And so they turned the bright light, I looked to the crowd so that I could get the TV light, which goes on. So I'm in the middle of the interview, and all of a sudden, I see out of the corner of my eye, here comes a balloon. Uh, here comes a beach ball. So the beach ball hits me, and I'm standing there doing the interview with a guy, and I grab the ball, and I put it down between my feet, and uh, tried to kind of ignore it and finish the interview, which we did. Light goes off. And uh, our guest left the booth, and as soon as he did, I don't know why, but I had a pocket knife in my pocket. And I held that beach ball up for all to see, and I took that pocket knife and boom! Jacober looked at me and he went, oh my God. He said, you know what you have done. And I mean 19,000 boos into the Blues broadcast booth from that point on. The third period, I had a taste of relish and mustard and beer and uh, popcorn and everything was fired. It was such an extreme that we actually got on the phone to the truck and said, Would you, we need some Chicago policemen up here. I don't think we're going to get out of the box. <laughs> and uh, Larry Patey was actually on the ice and uh, he was the star of the game. And the end, we kind of rotated who would do the star of the game. You have to go down to the ice. As the game was winding down, Jacoba even said on the air, if you think I'm going to go down and do that interview, you're out of your mind. 
and two policemen escorted me down there amidst Boo still throwing stuff at me. I, Larry and I had to move way out on the ice, so uh, we and then had to get escorted out of the building as well. So I learned a lesson as a broadcaster, don't intimidate the crowd. You cannot win that one. <laughs>